tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Good evening, listener. You're listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. On tonight's program, we invite you to leave behind your safe reality and descend with us into the frightening depths of the most terrifying imaginations with audio adaptations of two rounds of frightening fiction about unusual ordinances and sinister sights. I'm Otis Jiry host of the Scary Stories Told in the Dark podcast, now in its seventh season. My show is available on iTunes and wherever podcasts can be found. But tonight, I'll be filling in as host on behalf of my good friend, Steve Taylor, and I'll be your guide as we traverse the dimly lit corridors of your darkest dreams. Joining us tonight to help bring to life the frightening fiction of Themyscira and Ryan Harville to life, our voice talent Steve Gray and Drew Blood. Now get your ticket ready, take your seat in our theater of the minds, and brace yourself. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. <laughs> our first tale tonight comes to us from author Themyscira and is performed by Steve Gray. In it, some local children learn the hard way, why a certain type of wintertime fun, enjoyed by others throughout the country, is against the law in their small town. A small town with some very dark secrets. Without further ado, I present to you, Snow Angels are illegal where I live. My town is one of the northwestern states, which, if you know anything about the northeast, means snow like six months out of the year. To make things worse, my town is approximately in the middle of bumfuck nowhere. We deal with it about as well as every other tiny northwestern town, which, well, all you need to know is that there's a town up here that is literally based around a prison. That's it. That's the whole point of the town. Pretty much just to house the people who work there. It's pretty dismal sometimes. So you'd think, given the lack of other things to do, they'd embrace all the types of winter entertainment. And you wouldn't be wrong. Snowmen are an art form in my town. Ice sculptures get pretty competitive. Tobogganing and sledding are big deals. But snow angels are illegal. In fact, I didn't even know they were a thing until I saw someone doing it on a film one time. I was over at a friend's house, and they had an older cousin visiting from out of town. She'd brought the tape with her. It was one of her favorites. She thought we'd love it. She saw Harry and I staring at the TV in confusion and laughed at us. What? You've never seen a snow angel? She asked us mockingly. I don't think it was malicious. I think she was just teasing the way some people do. You know the whole, kids these days, trope that every generation thinks they invented. We both shook our heads and she climbed to her feet, gesturing for us to follow her while she suited up to go outside. She got as far as falling on her back in the yard, us following her like ducklings, before my dad's friend came running out of the garage yelling at the top of his lungs. I'd never heard Harry's dad yell like that before ever and I've never heard him raise his voice since. Scared the bejesus out of all of us, including Harry's cousin. He sent Harry and I inside. And I didn't hear what he said to her, but she was as white as a sheet by the time he was done. They came back in afterwards and Harry's dad called mine to come pick me up. 
Harry's cousin never came to visit again, but I never forgot. I knew there was something wrong with making a snow angel, I just never knew what. Harry and I never discussed it. We went back to sledding and snow forts and never said a word. We both knew that something big had just happened, but neither one of us was old enough or mature enough to really take any meaning from it. Nearly a decade passed before we thought of it again. Harry and I were both pretty average looking kids. Neither of us had a whole lot going on to give us any kind of social edge, so dating in our very small high school where the girls outnumber the boys by something like 75% was pretty much a crapshoot. And neither of us was interested in the female half of the population. So when Harry formed a crush on Melissa, we both kind of knew it was doomed. I was his best friend though. It was my job to be supportive, so I didn't say anything. Like, at all. I didn't know the first thing about being a wingman, but I did hesitantly suggest that Harry might get Melissa's attention by doing something cool, which in teenage boy translates to stupid and or dangerous. Unfortunately, Harry took that advice to heart. God, how I wish I could take those words back now. It was late October, and it was already snowing pretty regularly. Nothing bad yet, but more than just a light dusting. Halloween fell on a Wednesday that year, so the weekend before, a few of us got together for a kind of preemptive party. We'd basically turned it into an excuse to party the whole week. We were out at Harry's new house. His dad had recently built a really nice new place outside of town. It was kind of isolated, but it also had a hot tub, so... And anyway, the isolation worked in our favor. Nobody was liable to file a noise complaint or a curfew violation on us way out here. The irony is, Harry's dad had actually given us permission to have a little get-together as long as we promised to be responsible. I guess it was because Harry was kind of going through a hard time, what with his mom having left and all. It was a full moon that night. It wasn't snowing, but it had that morning. There was still a pretty thick carpet of it all across the lawn. There were eight of us, four boys, four girls. Harry and myself, Melissa, her best friend Joan, her little sister Nicole, and their boyfriends Travis, Hunter, and Chad. Melissa and Nicole were in the hot tub with Chad and Travis, while Joan and Hunter and Harry and I were playing Pong on the deck. Harry and I were losing pretty badly, actually. Travis was mocking us from the hot tub, his arm around Melissa. Nice shot, asshole, he'd commented after one of Harry's swings had gone wild. The ball tapped impatiently across the deck, careening off into the snow beyond. Harry made an impatient sound. I could tell Travis's comments were starting to get under his skin. His jaw was clenched and I could visibly see him holding back his temper as he marched down the steps to collect the ball. Come on, I hissed at Travis under my breath. Quit being a douche. Travis opened his mouth, most likely to say something nasty, but before he could get the words out, I heard Harry call out, Hey Melissa, want to see something cool? We all turned expectantly just in time to see Harry pitch backwards into the snow with his arms splayed out. Oh yeah, real cool turd money, Travis jeered. You fell down, way to go, I bet your mom's real proud. What did you just say? Harry stopped mid-snow angel. We all kind of fell silent for a second. Even Melissa looked shocked. She put Travis's arms away and scooted to the other side of the tub, giving him a look of disgust. Too far, Travis, she muttered. Maybe he knew it too. I'd like to think he was going to apologize, but Harry was already getting up and Melissa was leaning out of the tub, trying to change the subject, and asking Harry what he'd done. And then we all heard it. None of us seemed to know what it was at first. It was hard to recognize. A short, sharp sound as if someone had just been socked in the gut. You know that sound you make when you've had the breath knocked out of you? It was like that. It's a snow angel, I said into the silence, afterwards trying to tell myself that it was just one of those weird sounds that came out of the woods sometimes. Oh, Melissa furrowed her brow. Hey, I think I've heard of those, Hunter put in. One of those kids from Moore got arrested for making one in the town square after the game. His parents had to come pick him up. Let's Google it. Inside. 
I was quick to suggest, but then the second sob interrupted me before I could get further than a few steps toward the house. What was that? Joan asked. Harry finished climbing to his feet and stooped to pick up the ping pong ball. I didn't hear whatever Harry's response was. I was too busy looking, frozen in place, riveted by the sight of the single pale hand draped across the edge of the snow angel's wing. This time we all heard the wail and knew exactly what it was. The identical looks of confusion and fear that flickered across all our faces gave it away. What the fuck? Travis said. Oh my god! Joan shrieked. Harry! I yelped. I don't have any conscious memory of crossing the deck. I blinked and suddenly I was there, leaning over the railing and grabbing him by the shirt, hauling him away from the snow and toward the steps. Meanwhile, an ethereal vision was rising out of the snow angel as if it were rising on a pedestal. Blonde hair, coated in frost. Pale skin mottled with blackened spots. Blue lips bowed back in a grimace of misery. She was wearing a brittle gray robe. It crackled as she climbed from her knees to her feet. What the fuck? What the fuck? What the fuck? Travis was wheezing a new mantra somewhere behind us. Get in the house! Someone else yelled. I held Harry's arms, helping him climb over the railing. We raced into the house hand in hand, a frenzy of splashing and screaming going on around us. I sprinted as far as the couch before Harry dropped my hand and went back to lock the glass door. Nicole and Joan huddled against the far wall, sobbing softly. Melissa ran to the kitchen. Travis hovered near the window, staring in shock. What the fuck is that? He squealed. I wanted to cover my eyes, but I couldn't help but look. I was drawn to that face. The look of terror and pain on it. I could still hear the sobbing through the glass as it tottered unsteadily to the steps and began to drag itself up onto the deck. It, she, moved so wrong so stiffly. Oh God, Harry muttered beside me. I managed to glance at him only to see him look back at the snow, not the thing, but the place it had come from. There was another hand edging out of the snow angel. This one wrinkled and shriveled. We have to get out of here. Melissa came out of the kitchen carrying a kitchen knife. We have to get back to town and call the police. Harry's place was brand new. The landlines hadn't been hooked up yet. Yeah, I agreed. Just one problem, Harry put in, lifting a hand and singling out the keys and phones sitting out beside the hot tub. Travis's keys, Jones and Nicole's too. We all shared a look because that only left two cars. My beaten up Suburban, which barely had heat, not usually a huge problem, since I was typically dressed while inside it, but given that, half the party was still soaked from the hot tub and wearing only their bathing suits, and Melissa's coupe, which would barely fit four people, even if they sat on each other's laps. Fuck, Hunter yelled. I don't think we have a choice. I ran my fingers through my hair. Just grab some coats and blankets and let's go. Hypothermia has to be better than whatever's going to happen when she... They... Harry interrupted quickly. I didn't bother to respond to that. I just dug my keys out of my jacket and headed for the door. I heard the others scrambling to grab what they could and following. As soon as I was out the door, I heard the howling. Not like wolves. Like people. More than one. Just... Screaming. I sprinted down the driveway, half aware that I ought to have waited. I ought to have given the others more time to get ready, but some part of me just knew that every second we wasted was a step closer to death. And I wasn't kidding when I said our chances were probably better for recovering from hypothermia. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw Melissa and Travis make it to her car, Nicole right behind them. Chad, Hunter, and Harry and Joan were hot on my heels. 
I didn't have to bother to unlock the doors, my Suburban predated electronic locks, and the town was so small that normally I didn't bother locking them all individually. We scrambled in so hard that it rocked. The old shocks squealed and squeaked in protest. I dove into the driver's seat and slammed my key into the ignition, ignoring the seatbelt and everything else while the others dragged themselves in and hauled the door shut behind them. I didn't do a head count before peeling out. That came back to me later. It was a miracle no one got left behind. If they had, it would have been my fault. I still feel guilty about that. I saw them coming around the corner of the house in the rearview mirror. Not my friends, but the corpses. I was full on panicking. Each heartbeat felt like a punch to the ribs. My breath felt like razor blades. I was so, so sure that I was going to puke as I swung onto the highway, already doing 80 before we'd done a half a mile. Joan was still sobbing in the back seat. Hunter was crying too. I think I would have joined them if I hadn't been too busy shaking. Does anyone have a phone? Chad asked. It was a great idea. I glanced at him in the rearview mirror and saw him covered in an old blanket I kept in the truck bed. His hair was trying to frost. He had a cell phone in his palm. I started to ask what was wrong with it when Joan chimed in. Yeah, but no bars. I'm going straight to the police station, I said. Being that I was the one driving, nobody else had much say in it. What if they don't believe us? Joan whispered. They're going to, Harry said woodenly, staring straight ahead. They made them illegal for a reason. Why didn't they tell us? Hunter demanded. Nobody answered. I guess nobody had an answer. It was a tense, long period of silence during which I checked the rearview mirror a dozen times. Not just checking for weird, frozen zombies, but for headlights. Where was Melissa's car? My old Suburban couldn't have been that much faster. My palms were sweating and prickling on the steering wheel. I tried not to think about it or draw attention to it the last 15 minutes into town. Part of me was hoping to get pulled over by a cop. But as was typical, there was never one around when I wanted one to be. I kept looking for them, even as we barreled into town and into the safety of the slushy gray parking lot of the sheriff's department. I nearly drove right through the front doors. The whole car lurched from the force of that stop. But I hadn't even slammed it into park before the others were scrambling out the doors and pouring into the station like a biblical flood of half-frozen, half-dressed teenagers. Everyone was talking at once. I was the last in keeping one eye on the window and the road while the others babbled at Ollie, the receptionist. He was a nice old man in his fifties at least, and I could tell he understood about zero of what was being said, until Harry stepped forward and put his hands on the desk. Anyway, everyone else finally stopped talking. I made a snow angel. He stated calmly, factually. If it weren't for how pale his face was and how tight his bloodless lips had become, I would have thought he was calm. Ollie's face fell. His chair clattered as it rolled back, allowing him to stand up. I'll go get the sheriff. I knew then that it was every bit as serious as we thought it was. We hadn't imagined any of it. It wasn't some case of mass hysteria or something. There's something else. I added, pausing to look out the window, hoping to see Melissa's car pulling in at the last second. It never did. I haven't seen Melissa, Travis, or Nicole since we left the house. Holly's expression turned graver, if that was possible. The sheriff was Melissa and Nicole's father. He turned and hustled to the back faster than I've ever actually seen him move before. There was a tense moment. A hushed exchange of words and rising voices. And then Sheriff Basket came striding down the hallway, bigger than life. He was a massive wall of a man, and all of us had always been a little intimidated by him. He had never been mean, exactly. He was just stern, quiet, had a direct, down-to-earth way of dealing with things, and usually that involved as few words as possible. How many were there? Case in point. I didn't understand what he was asking at first, 
but Harry got it straight away. Two, but I think a third was climbing out when we left. I watched Ollie getting some emergency blankets and jumpsuits out of the back for the others. For Chad, anyway. Hunter, Joan, Harry, and I were all more or less dressed. Ollie passed me a blanket anyway. I mumbled a thank you. What did the first one look like? The sheriff demanded. It was a woman! Joan shouted. Her voice sounded reedy and thin. I thought maybe she was on the verge of hyperventilating. She had on this dress thing, Chad added, more subdued. And she was blonde, I think. It's hard to remember. She was pretty, Hunter whispered, sinking into his blanket and the wall at the same time. She looked so sad. The sheriff looked visibly relieved, but his face was still tight with stress and concern. He looked gray, actually. His skin, his hair, even his eyes. I didn't blame him. I was only a teenager myself at the time, but already I could sympathize. I understood the terror he must have felt, knowing his kids were out there, in danger. Not knowing if he'd arrive in time or what might have befallen them. You kids stay here. Ollie, call their parents. You lot were at the Olsen place, right? He pinned us with a severe look. I nodded. I'm pretty sure the others did too. I heard one or two meek, Yes, sirs. Your parents can explain when they get here. Those last few words were so clipped and bitten off that I could hear his teeth click on some of the syllables. I, for one, wasn't about to argue. I wanted to see my mom and dad more than anything in the world in that moment. I was still young enough that for me they represented the epitome of safety. Nothing bad could happen to me when my parents were there in my adolescent mind. They were still invulnerable giants. Axis upon which the world turned. I watched in silence as he checked his revolver and then went to the munitions room and came back with a shotgun and a box of shells. He walked out into the night without even a nod in our direction. His eyes were already on the road. He looked to me like a man going to war, as if he weren't sure if he was going to come back and was prepared to accept that. Resigned, but also determined. Come on, kids. Ollie spread his arms and herded us all toward the back of the station. Let's get you warmed up. If any of you have a working phone, now's the time to go ahead and call your parents. It'll be better coming from your number than the police stations. Those of you who don't, sorry. He joked and pointed an ominous finger at the payphone on the wall and the stack of quarters beside it. He was a nice old man, had kind of a beardless Santa vibe, but it was hard to ignore the tightness in his voice and around his eyes. Poor Ollie. He had to be pushing 60. He'd been working in the sheriff's department since I was a kid. Sometimes he came to help provide security at events in town. He'd never been anything but cheerful and friendly. Seeing him so pale made me feel helpless. What we'd seen at Harry's house still hadn't completely sunk in. A part of me thought that I was going to wake up at any second and that it would all turn out to have been a bad dream. All around me, the others were calling their parents. I heard phones ringing. A couple had already picked up. Voices were cracking. Muffled sobs and sniffles filled the open office space. I looked aimlessly between the desks for a little while, my brain not quite having caught up to the idea I should be doing what they were all doing. Eventually, my gaze drifted to Harry, only to find him looking back. It struck me then that he didn't have anybody to call. His mom was, well, he couldn't call her, and his dad was probably still on the plane, which meant he didn't have anybody but me. I guess we should call mom and dad. I tried to smile, fumbling my cell out of my pocket. They'll be pissed if they're the last ones to know. Internally, I cringed. Why had I said that? Especially after literally just thinking he couldn't call his dad. Harry only nodded. My mom picked up on the second ring. 
I called her first because I figured she'd be the least likely to yank my ass through the phone to chew me a new one. I needn't have bothered, it turned out. We're on our way, she said before I could even say hello. Stay put. And then she hung up. But before she did, I heard keys jingling in the background and the car starting up. Cell phones were notoriously unreliable in my town. A text could be sent and hang in limbo for a week before arriving at its destination. Calls often just failed to connect. I glanced down at the phone in my hand and up at Harry, running my fingers over the glossy screen. They're on their way, I reported. Harry just nodded again. My house was 20 minutes away from the station on a bad day. My parents made it in seven. I guess that's where I got my lead foot from. Joan and Chad's parents made it first, but only by a few minutes. Both sets swarmed their respective offspring. There was a lot of scolding and fussing and anxious questions. I couldn't help but think they looked like preschoolers. Small and lost and wide-eyed despite their ages. Maybe it was because I was feeling like one myself. Just a small kid on a big playground, woefully out of my league. And then my parents came rushing through the door. Mom's coat was barely on, unfastened and hanging off her as she stormed in. Dad's boots were untied. They looked like they'd dropped everything and run to come get me. And I was so grateful for it. It was the most loved feeling I think a person could have. Dad rushed to me. But Mom paused mid-step and diverted to Harry. I wasn't jealous. I was weak-kneed with gratitude. Trust my parents, the adults, to know how to make right the things I didn't have the tools to fix myself. I learned a lot about empathy and maturity that day, watching my mom fuss over Harry as if he were her own. He'd been my best friend since childhood. He'd practically grown up in our house, and I in his. My parents were the closest thing he had to his own in that moment. Maybe better knowing his parents like I did. She checked him over like the other parents were checking their kids, hands and face, arms and neck. Thank God you're okay, Dad said, catching me up and squeezing me like I was nine again. I squeezed him right back, fighting tears. They didn't touch you? Y you're all right? Mom was asking Harry. All he could do was nod, I assume. His eyes were suspiciously bright. It's okay, Mom said, giving him the same kind of hug Dad was giving me just then. It's going to be okay. Melissa and Nicole were in the other car, Chad half yelled. I know he was talking to his own parents, but all of them stopped and looked at one another, sharing the look of horror and tense gratitude. How awful, but thank God mine are all right. Ollie said you'd explain when you got here. I wiped my eyes on the back of my sleeve and looked up at my father's face. His blue eyes were haunted and unhappy, but he nodded once. Yeah, I guess it's time. Normally we tell the graduating class after the ceremony. Mom looked up. They met eyes for a little while. I imagine they were searching for the words, for a good place to begin. Why didn't anyone explain before? Joan demanded. Why didn't anybody warn us? Let's start with the most immediate problem, my dad suggested when no one else spoke up. Tackle one thing at a time. First of all, what did the first thing through look like? I don't know if it occurred to the others, but it struck me that this was the second time we'd been asked, and both times it had been the first question, after asking if we were okay. She was blonde and pale and wearing a weird dress. She looked like she was in pain, I supplied, anchored by the presence of my parents. It seemed to me that every adult in the room heaved a little sigh of relief. That's good. I mean, it's not great, but it's better than it could be, Mom muttered, wandering over to the pile of blankets on the desk and absently gathering one. I watched her bring it over to Harry to drape around his shoulders fussing with the way it hung until there were no wrinkles to smooth out anymore. 
We'll start with that, then. Dad took a deep breath. We call her The Angel. That's what our grandparents called her. I assume that's what their grandparents called her. Of all the Harbingers, she's the least violent. She'll lead the people behind her to the nearest, most easily accessible source of heat. Once they're all thawed, they'll go away again. As Dad explained, I absentmindedly rubbed my chest. It hurt, like I pulled a muscle. Harry looked up, expression going from numb and distracted to suddenly upset. Melissa's car. Adam's heat doesn't work. I... they must have... Dad looked grim, but nodded. It's possible, especially if the doors to the house were locked. The good news is they won't have hurt the others unless they tried to stop them. The bad news is, if the car stops running, or the heat quits, they'll go back to trying to get into the house. Everyone took a minute to digest that. So, all they want is to get warm? I asked, hesitantly. Yeah, Dad nodded. But only if the Harbinger is the angel. Okay, Chad looked up at his parents. But what are they? As far as we can tell, Chad's mom was the school nurse, a petite blonde lady with a can I speak to your manager haircut, but as sweet as could be, answered this time. They were people, people who used to live here at some point, people who died in the cold. Then there can't be that many, right? Jones suggested hopefully. It was a hope I didn't realize I shared it till that moment. Surely one or two frozen zombies were a lot better than a horde, though. Dozens. At least forty, my own mother put in. She gave Harry a little squeeze and looked at me apologetically. I'm sorry, honey. There's others, but they don't all come at the same time. Usually. It all depends on the Harbinger, like we said. Usually it's no more than eight or nine at a time. But sometimes when the shepherd comes through the who the what travis cried his voice warbling a high awkward note that i thought he'd left behind in middle school harbingers are dad rubbed his fingers together obviously searching for the words they're like the leaders only one comes through at a time they're the first out through the gate when it's open when a snow angel is made some of them, like the angel, are mostly harmless. Mostly. There are four that we know of. Four that we were told about. Her, the shepherd, the prophet, and the hermit. He walked away from me while he spoke, folding his hands behind his back and pacing over to the desk, and from there to the window. The angel comes with eight or nine others, who are mostly peaceful. They'll smash doors and windows if they have to, but so long as they're left alone and you don't attempt to harm them, they're harmless. They'll find the nearest source of heat and stay there until they are all warm again. I didn't want to think about it too hard. I hoped it was more supernatural than it sounded. Because the way he put it made me think of a bunch of warming corpses in a room, and that made my stomach churn. The shepherd is one of the worst. They... He, we think, comes through with all of the followers, and he's not content with just them, either. He hunts down anyone he can find when he comes through, and will drag them out into the cold to die and join his herd. He sends the others, too. If he ever gets through, the only thing to do is start the siren and get to the bunkers around town, and then pray that the barricades last until dawn. I started to shake just thinking about it, imagining it was... It made me feel cold from the inside out. I shared a look with Harry, knowing he felt the same way. How close we'd all come to that. What he had to be feeling knowing that he'd almost let that through. Then there's the prophet. She won't outright hurt you, but if she finds you, she'll... It's hard to explain. She puts people to sleep in a way, mesmerizes them with a song, and when you're under, apparently you have visions of the past, of things that happened in this town. 
Compared to the shepherd, that sounded like a cakewalk. But you're there until she's done with you, which could be hours, and wherever she catches you, which might be out in the cold, or in the shower, or... He left the rest up to the imagination. Her followers put out lights. They pull down electric lines and will smash lamps. Okay, that sounded less ideal, but still a whole lot better than the zombie murder Woodstock. The hermit is the worst, though. My dad looked at Hunter's parents and then Jones, and finally sighed like he didn't want to be the one to say the words. They come alone, and unlike the others, they won't vanish at daylight. They keep hunting, keep killing, following the people of the town no matter where they run until a sacrifice is made. Our parents thought that might have been where the new harbingers come from. Sacrifices to make the hermit go away. That's horrible, Joan gasped. I cringed too. It was awful to think about. Deliberately selecting someone you knew, someone who you lived with, to go die. And then making that happen. Killing them in the worst way I could imagine. How did you even begin? But it's just the angel this time, Hunter said, his voice shaking. Yeah, my dad nodded. She should be gone by morning. So that was it then. We just had to make it to morning, and then everything would be okay, right? It wasn't though. In fact, I can confidently say that was the beginning of the end. The slow roll into the destruction of the town and the majority of the people who lived there. For a time, it was quiet. A few of us managed to fall asleep, either in the padded branches of the holding cells or in the chairs lined up against the walls. I was still wide awake, watching the windows with Harry and clutching a cup of hot cocoa for warmth. The hands of the clock barely seemed to move, and then, with a pop and a crackle, the dispatch radio came to life. It was the sheriff. I didn't understand the codes he was using, but I got the gist of it pretty good from everything that was said between. Multiple 123s, more units required, send medical and the blasters. After that, it was a flurry of voices and sirens. Orders were being shouted, sirens blared. Ollie sat behind his desk and closed his eyes. His lips moved silently tracing the words of some prayer. I reached for Harry's hand, but the look in his eye, he was practically on the moon, so far away I couldn't reach him. We both knew that it was going to be bad. We didn't know how bad until one of the other officers started talking. We've got two injured juveniles en route to the hospital. Clear the roads, provide escort where possible. Only two? We've got eyes on them. Eight. Angel is missing. Repeat, the angel is missing. One victim unaccounted for. All units respond. It went on like that for a while. The noise woke up everyone who had managed to fall asleep. One by one we gathered at the window, watching for the flashing lights as they sped like shooting stars down the main road toward our tiny, provincial hospital. Wondering who was inside, and if they'd make it. Eventually, the noise from the radios died down to chatter back and forth between officers sweeping the woods. I gathered bits and pieces, but no more. Something about a set of bare footprints heading into the woods. Something else about a second, fresher set of tracks behind. Both vanished near the pond. The search went on, but nothing else important was said. Eventually, the first blush of dawn touched the sky. We watched it rise, Harry and I side by side as the first of the officers returned to the station, muddy and disheartened. The adults gathered in a huddle with them. I wasn't meant to overhear, but my ears had always been sharp, like the radio, now in person. I caught snatches that were just enough to paint a picture. Travis and Nicole, broken arm, severe frostbite should recover. Melissa. Missing. Old Lake. 
angel. They told the rest of us a barely edited version of events a few hours later. Travis and Nicole had been found outside Harry's place. Travis had a broken arm. Both he and Nicole had pretty bad frostbite and were suffering from hypothermia but were expected to mostly recover. Melissa was still missing. They thought the angel's flock had mobbed the car while Nicole was still getting in. Melissa had gotten it started, but hadn't driven away immediately because her sister wasn't fully inside yet. Travis had taken the passenger seat and Nicole couldn't get in past him as he was too big. Well, the delay was enough for the heater to get started. The dead had converged on the heat and when Travis tried to fight back, they'd tossed him aside like an old newspaper. Melissa must have run. She didn't know what we'd just been told. She probably thought they were being attacked. I mean, that's what I would have thought. Did think. But in the end, I guess it doesn't really matter why she ran into the woods. They never did find her. We all went home, one by one. Harry's dad came home on the next plane, but understandably, Harry didn't want to stay in that house anymore. They moved away a couple of months later. Not long after Nicole and Travis finally got out of the hospital. Travis ended up losing the arm. The frostbite combined with the break made it impossible to save. They tried, but in the end there was nothing to be done. Nicole recovered physically all right. She lost a few toes and a finger, but the real damage was psychological. Losing her older sister like that, the way it all went down, she was never the same. The rest of us got together after graduation, the same party where the town's secrets would originally have been explained to us. It turned out there were a few things we still hadn't been told. I just don't understand why anyone lives here at all, Joan was saying to Mr. Harkman, the man that had formerly been our math teacher for pretty much our entire lives. The town wasn't big enough that we really needed more than one or two. There were rarely more than 30 kids per grade. I was standing by myself under a pennant banner, watching the flecks of light from the disco ball swim around the floor. She was going off to college next spring. So was I. I think we all were, except Nicole and Travis and Hunter, I think. He had decided to stay behind, or maybe he couldn't afford college. I don't know. I never thought to ask. Most people do leave, Mr. Harkman sighed. I think we all tried to escape at one point or another. Escape? Chad, who had been over in the corner beside Hunter and a couple of other kids from our grade, lifted his head to ask. By then, the story of that night had spread to every kid in our tiny high school, regardless of grade. I can't help but think that was a good thing. Well, why'd they come back then? Joan demanded heatedly at the same moment. Her face was flushed, her eyes glittering. Your parents didn't tell you? Mr. Harkman looked surprised, and then just sad. I'm sorry. I guess I can see why. The thing is, you can leave the town just fine until you have kids, and then the town pulls you back. Things happen. You lose your job. You have an accident. Your plane or bus gets rerouted. You black out and wake up here in town with your kid. It's inevitable. If you try to leave... You end up here again. A hush fell over the room. I don't know if they were thinking the same thing I was, but my very first thought was, I'm never having kids. Poor Harry. If only anyone had told him. Today's episode of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights is proudly brought to you by Shudder a premium video service brought to you by AMC Networks, offering an unbeatable selection of expertly curated and unique collections of horror, supernatural, and thrillers, uncut and commercial-free, with exclusive and original titles you won't find anywhere else. 
And as a listener of this program, you can start your free trial today risk-free. As the world's premier streaming service for horror, thriller, and supernatural content, Shudder is spooky 24-7, 365. Just because Halloween has come and passed doesn't mean that the scares don't continue. Sign up for Shudder and get access to the largest collection of acclaimed horror movies and series streamed right to your favorite devices. What makes it even better is you get unlimited access to stream ad-free on iPhone, iPad, Apple TV, Xbox One, Amazon Fire TV, Google Chromecast, Roku, and Android devices. For just $5.99 per month or $56.99 per year with Shudder, you'll be able to stream great thrillers, horror, and suspense movies, television series, documentaries, and more 24-7 anywhere you go. Think of it as the Netflix of horror. And the best part is, there are new spine-tingling thrillers, shocking horrors, and edge-of-your-seat suspense added weekly. Exclusive titles this season, one of my favorites, The Creep Show Animated Special, which is a Shudder original series, Leap of Faith, William Friedkin on The Exorcist, Blood Vessel, Scare Me, starring Josh Rubin, Ava Cash, and Chris Redd, and the Mario Bava Collection. Get started streaming the best horror, thriller, and supernatural content. Shudder's expertly curated collection includes titles like the acclaimed Tigers Are Not Afraid, One Cut of the Dead, Revenge, and the Creepshow TV series, produced by Greg Nicotero and based on the famous films by George Romero. To try Shudder free for 30 days, go to Shudder.com and use promo code CTDN. Once again, that's Shudder, spelled S-H-U-D-D-E-R dot com, and use promo code CTDN, spelled C-T-D-N, to start your free trial now. And thank you for supporting our sponsor and this show. I hope you enjoyed Snow Angels Are Illegal Where I Live, as written by Themis Cura and performed by Steve Gray. Up next, we've got a second sinister story for you, as written by Ryan Harville and performed by Drew Blood. If you enjoyed Drew's performance, please check out more of his work on our channel as well, under the series of the same name. Drew is releasing brand new content every week as well, so you've got plenty of catching up to do, and plenty more to come. In Drew and Ryan's latest contribution, we'll meet a gentleman who receives a mysterious visitor at his door, an unexpected guest that takes their leave as quickly as they arrived, but not before making a sinister delivery. Now, without further ado, I present to you, Once Was Blind. I awoke to a knock on the door. I'd been out drinking the night before, had a few too many, and was sleeping it off. I turned over to face the clock, and it stark red numbers, read 8, 19 a.m. I got out of bed slowly, wincing at the creaking in my lower back. The knock came again, and I shuffled down the hall, still wearing the clothes I passed out in the night before. It took a couple of fumbling tries, but I finally managed to undo the locks and open the door a few inches. Oh. A bright slice of sunlight pierced the gap, and I squinted with a groan. Yeah, I said, my tongue sticking to the roof of my mouth. The delivery guy stood there, smiling, resplendent in his pressed uniform. Mr. Parker? he asked. Uh, Mr. Samuel Parker? Yeah? Uh, good morning, he said, holding out the package. Sorry to wake you, but a signature's required for the delivery. Uh, delivery? I took the shoebox-sized box. What? <clears throat> what is it? He shook his head. No idea, sir. Just sign here and it's all yours. 
He held out a pen, and I dutifully signed along the line at the bottom of the page. Great, he said, flashing another smile. <laughs> Get into some trouble last night? <laughs> Maybe. I'm not really sure, <laughs> I said, deciding to humor him. Memory is kind of fuzzy at the moment. <clears throat> the delivery man laughed. <laughs> I remember those days, prowling around like a tomcat, he said and winked. Listen, take a few teaspoons of sugar, one of salt, and mix it in a tall glass of water. Sip it till it's gone. It'll make the rest of your day a whole lot better. <laughs> <clears throat> Thanks, I said. I, uh, <clears throat> I appreciate that. No problem at all, the delivery man said. <laughs> you wouldn't want your day to be ruined by some mistakes from last night, right? <laughs> I attempted a response, failed, and just waved instead. I closed the door against a hateful sunlight. Back in the kitchen, I mixed a drink in silence as I stared down at the box on the counter. It was wrapped in brown paper, held together by duct tape. All the delivery info was written out with a black marker in all capital letters. <sighs> Addressed his road, I read. <clears throat> Wherever the hell that is. I grabbed the knife from the butcher's block and slit the tape, then peeled away the paper to find a plain cardboard box. I lifted the lid. Inside was a framed photo, cushioned by a pile of shredded newspaper. It showed a couple standing at the altar, their arms around each other, the priest behind them smiling widely. Someone had scratched out each person's eyes, leaving white lacerations across their faces. What the fuck is this? I turned the frame around and unclipped the back and searching for an answer. Written on the back of the photo were two names I didn't recognize and a date from fifteen years ago that had as little meaning to me as the names did. There was a message scrawled across the bottom. I don't know what it said, and even if I did, I would not tell you. It's not that it was in a different language. It was just... <laughs> I'm not sure. It was a spiky script, like the readout of a heart monitor dipping and ascending with each pen stroke, but I could still read it, and it hurt. The pain began building behind my eyes, completely overshadowing the headache from my hangover. The pressure peaked and I staggered back, dropping the frame to the floor where the glass shattered and the wood splintered. I shoved the heels of my hands against my eyelids and screamed. My head felt like an inflating balloon that had reached its limit. Just when I was sure I was having a stroke, the pressure stopped and the sensation slid away from my eyes, moving into my sinuses and growing there like a sudden head cold. It began to throb in time with my heartbeat. I'm not sure how much time passed as I stood there in the kitchen panting, my teeth clenched against the pain. When I lowered my hands, I opened my eyes to darkness. I was blind. No images, no colors, not even black. There was nothing. I stumbled but succeeded in grabbing the counter. Feeling my way along, my hand bumped into my keys and sent them clattering to the floor. I knew my cell phone must be close and was more than relieved when my hand fell upon its familiar shape. I used my fingerprint to unlock the phone. Call Michael, I said. The phone chirped in response. The ringing went on for an eternity. Finally, my brother answered. Sam? He laughed. What are you doing up before nine on a Saturday? Mike, listen. Something's happened. I'm hurt. And no, this is not a joke. What happened? Where are you? Still at home. Wait, wait. Why are you calling me instead of, you know, a medical professional? It's not, I began, but then couldn't find the right words. It's not medical. Uh, maybe it is. Shit, man. I don't know. Just get over here, okay? There was a moment of silence. Uh, okay. He said. I'm leaving now. But this had better not be some kind of prank, man. It's not. 
Just yeah, yeah, Michael said and hung up. I slowly made my way into the living room and managed to find the couch without tripping and breaking my neck. I sat down and waited in my new dark world, trying not to panic, but I could feel it rising regardless, pushing its way up my throat like bile. My brother only lived 20 minutes away, but it was a long 20 minutes of just sitting there, listening to myself breathe. Eventually, there was a knock at the door. Mike, I called out. I heard the door creak open. Yeah, it's me. What? What are you doing? I'm blind, Mike, I said. I can't see was what I meant to say. But that was wrong, because just then my sight started to return. The world started to form around me. No colors, but shapes were becoming clear. I looked to the door, to my brother. And coherent thought left my mind in an instant. Michael stood in the doorway, the monochromatic sunlight framing him from behind. His face was a ruin, his skin drooping away from his skull like melted wax. Serrated antlers hung from each side of his head, twisting into curls like the horns of a ram. Sam, what's wrong with you? He said, shambling toward me on legs of ripped muscle and hanging veins that fluttered like seaweed in the strong current. I screamed and backed away to the furthest edge of the couch. Get back! Get the fuck back! He stopped. Hey, calm down. It's just me. What the hell is going on? For a wonder, I did stop. I squeezed my eyes shut. Mike? Yeah? Say something. Something only the two of us would know. Uh, your middle name is Brian. No, I said. S- something more specific. Um, he said. Uh, let's see. When you were 12, I caught you in the bathroom. Okay, okay. Enough, I said. It is you. But you don't look like you. Sam, I swear to God, if this is some prank. No, no prank, I said. Hold on. I need to check something. Move away from the door, off to the side where I can't see you. I heard his shuffling steps, then opened my eyes. The door stood open, showing a scene of gray grass and white sky. Something shambled along the sidewalk. Matted hair trailed down its flayed back, braided with strips of skin. Its left arm hung low, the claws at the tips of its fingers causing sparks as they skipped against the concrete. In its right, it held a loop of intestine tied around the throat of some beast, its carapace shining in the morning light. I struggled to keep my vomit down, but a sour belch escaped my mouth, leaving a greasy taste in its wake. Do you see that, Mike? I said pointing a shaken finger at the abomination outside. (laughs) Please tell me you see that. Yeah, he said. One of your neighbors is walking their dog. So? No, it's... I said, then trailed off, unable to explain. I felt Michael grab my arm. Come on, back to the couch, he said, leading me away from the door. I heard him close it, then felt his weight settle beside me as he sat down. Okay, I said, this is going to sound fucked up. I explained the events of the morning, keeping my eyes closed the entire time. When I finished, I heard Michael walk into the kitchen and the sounds of him inspecting the box. Who delivered this? I honestly didn't pay attention. I'm exhausted and hung over. Figures, he said. And who are... Don't look at that! I cried, remembering the picture. I didn't look at the back. Chill out. I slumped against the back of the couch, relieved. So, he said, some mystery company delivered a mysterious package containing a mysterious photo that made you go blind. Yes, 
I sighed. And now you can see, but everything's in black and white, and I look like some sort of creature that crawled out of a grave? When you put it like that, it sounds crazy. I could hear the sudden swish of him turning the box around on the counter. Well, what about this web address, he said. I blinked. I don't know what you're talking about. On the bottom, after the return address, there's a URL. Looks like random characters. I've seen something like this before. Well, what is it? I could hear the pleading in my voice and hated it. Can it help? Hold on, he said. I need to check it out. There was the unmistakable sound of a zipper being unzipped. What are you doing? Getting my laptop out, he said. You're lucky I'm on call for work this weekend. Otherwise, I'd have left it at home. Is there a need for emergency virus protection updates on the weekends? I quipped. I didn't have to see his expression to know what it was. There's a lot more to IT security than viruses, dick. The sound of typing punctuated the silent pauses. You could have just used my tablet, I said. No, I couldn't. You need a special kind of browser for staying anonymous. Makes sense, I said, though it didn't, but I couldn't think about it then. This isn't just a regular site that you can pull up on Google, he said. It's on the dark web. A whole network of sites that aren't indexed by search engines, and they're only accessible by certain browsers, if you want to remain anonymous, which is kind of the whole point. You can only find what you need if you know what you're looking for, or in certain situations, by invitation only. What kind of situations? I asked, uncertain if I even wanted to know. The highly illegal kind. Drugs, usually, and worse. Worse? What, hit men for hire? Government secrets? Worse, Michael said flatly. I let that last one slide, certain this time that I didn't want to know. So you're going to, what, hack into the site? His laugh made me feel stupid immediately. <laughs> hack? Um, no. This address is probably passed from an individual, given access to specifically chosen people. <laughs> Like me? Maybe, he said. Let's find out. More clacking and keystrokes. Okay, I'm at the site, he said. It's very basic, but I need a pin to get inside. My alcohol-addled brain decided to start working. <clears throat> How many digits? Eight. <sighs> this picture, I said. The date on the back. That's gotta be it. That seems a little too obvious, he said. I nodded. Exactly. You said these things are sometimes invitation only. Someone meant for me to see the address. Why not the pen? Grab the photo. I listened as he walked into the kitchen, crunching over the broken glass. A moment later, I could feel him pressing the photo into my hand. Oh, thanks, I said. Now step back. No offense, but I don't want to risk looking at you again. None taken, he said. I opened my eyes, bracing for the worst, but nothing had changed. Everything was as colorless as an old 1950s sitcom. Okay, here. I read off the numbers. We're in, he said. I can't believe you were right. Thanks a lot. It's... it's a video feed, he said. Just a room. Some covered furniture, that's about it. I need to see, I said. Come sit beside me. Just let me do the driving so I don't see you. I closed my eyes as he passed me, then felt the weight of the laptop as he positioned it on top of my thighs. I opened my eyes. It was as he had described it, a nearly featureless room, until the door opened. A man walked out, dressed in a t-shirt and jeans. That's him, I cried. That's the delivery guy. Hello, Sam, the man said. I gotta say, I'm kind of surprised to see you this early. I thought it would take you longer to figure it out. But I see you had some help. <laughs> Michael quickly reached out and covered the webcam embedded in the top of the monitor. I barely suppressed a cry at the sight of his scabbed and twisted fingers. <laughs> it's okay, the man said with a laugh. I don't need to see you. 
I just need you to see this. He grabbed one of the furniture covers and pulled it away with a flourish, like a stage magician performing a trick. And there was Sadie, sitting in a chair, gagged and bound. Who the hell is that? Michael whispered. Go ahead. The man said. Tell him. Her name is Sadie, I said thickly, my mouth feeling like it was stuffed with cotton. She's the woman I've been seeing lately. Seeing? The man said. Is that what you call it? I said nothing. Now, the way I see it, the man said, striding over to Sadie, the only reason you're not strapped to this chair is that you didn't know. Know what? I cried. What is this about? That she was married. That we, he gestured to Sadie, are married. Fifteen years next month. I'm sorry, I said, and I meant it. Listen. I honestly had no idea. That's why I'm letting you live, he said, reaching behind the chair. He raised a knife in front of his face, studying it. But, unfortunately for her, she knew better. I shook my head, tears starting to blur my vision. Please don't hurt her, okay? Uh, people make mistakes. I, I'm, I'm sure we can talk. I will hurt her, he said. And you're going to watch. Or you can keep seeing the world with no color, and everyone you care about will be a monster in your eyes, like she now is in mine. Sadie's cries were muffled by the gag. A cornered animal, her eyes wild and bright with tears. <laughs> I can't, I sobbed. <laughs> I can't watch this. <laughs> it's up to you, he said. Watch what I do to her, and tomorrow you'll receive a letter with a special message just for you. Read it, and you'll be back to normal. Your choice, Sam. A few minutes of murder, or a lifetime of monsters. I looked at Michael. <laughs> at his bulging, yellow eyes. I nodded to him, and he removed his hand from the webcam, <laughs> and I watched. <laughs> When it comes to our personal mental health concerns, certain things can affect each of us differently. For me, as a narrator, it's the stress of getting work done in a required time frame, and then the anxiety of wondering, well, was that any good? Sometimes you just need someone to talk to, to put things into perspective for you. That's where BetterHelp can allow you to sort things out. BetterHelp isn't just self-help, but professional counselors who assess your needs then match you with your own licensed professional therapist connecting safely and privately online. You can begin in under 24 hours and you can message them at any time. BetterHelp has one commitment, to facilitate great therapeutic matches and they'll allow you to change counselors if you feel the need. Best of all, you can do it from home via scheduled weekly video or phone sessions and you can access them from anywhere in the world. Another plus is the vast range of expertise offered that may not be available locally to you. In fact, so many people have been using BetterHelp that they're recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. But what about the costs? They're more affordable than traditional counseling and financial aid is available. I want you to start living a happier life today. As a listener, You'll get 10% off your first month by visiting our sponsor at betterhelp.com slash chilling. Join over 1 million people who've taken charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash chilling. Tell them that Otis sent you, and thank you for your support of our sponsor and this program. I hope you enjoyed Once Was Blind. 
as written by Ryan Harvel and voiced by Drew Blood. If you enjoyed that last tale, I encourage all of you to visit Mr. Harvel's official website, ryanharvelwriting.com. Harvel is spelled H-A-R-V-I-L-L-E. Again, that's ryanharvelwriting.com. You can also find his works on Amazon.com or connect with him on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And don't forget, you can hear more of our friend Drew Blood via his series of the same name on our official YouTube channel, where you'll hear haunting new tales each and every week. If you check him out, be sure to give him a thumbs up and leave a kind word and tell him you heard him here on this program. I'd also like to invite you again to check out more Narrative Nightmares on my program, Scary Stories Told in the Dark, available now on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and wherever your favorite programs can be found, with seven thrilling seasons to sink your teeth into, with all the tales performed by yours truly, Otis Gyre. And if you drop by and like what I do, please take a moment to leave me a five-star review and a comment also. And let me know you heard about me here on Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. It would mean a lot to me. Now, our weekly descent into the depths has just about come to a close, but before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us for tonight's episode and remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you haven't already. And of course, subscribe to us on YouTube, where you can find an archive of our work going back to 2012. And consider signing up as a patron at our website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com, to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. I'm your host, Otis Jiry, and it's, as always, been a pleasure. Tune again next week when we once again turn off the lights and turn on the dark. <laughs> Sweet dreams, listener. Sweet dreams. Thanks for joining us. You've been listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, a production of Chilling Entertainment and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcasts Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted by yours truly, Steve Taylor. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Luke Hodgkinson and Jesse Cornett. Sound design and final mixing and mastering by executive producer and director Craig Groshek. Logo by Craig Groshek. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? We take submissions. Email it to us today at submissions at chillingtalesfordarknights.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of this show. If you enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave us a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to us. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and other programs and my channel. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for CTFDN as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew each and every week. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories including those you've heard on this program. We'll be back next week with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. But that's all right. Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.